Alicia Show, where extraordinary people say extraordinary things. Tonight, are you trapped in a life of prostitution? It was quick money, not easy money. Renee says she's quitting. Can she quit? Male prostitution is a reality. It's good money. Because Why do you want to get out? Yeah. A father who tried to get his son out, but it was too late. Come on, South Africa, what do we do for the prostitutes? Who are the clients? Society wants them there. Mm. Society pays them and society keeps them. Felicia! Felicia! Thank you. Thank you. Selling sex is not a subject South Africans want to talk openly about. We'd rather sweep that topic under the carpet and believe it does not happen here. But somehow, we have managed to get South Africans to talk about this age-old and sensitive subject. Let's see. What is more important to me is to be accepted by society, which is a wish that, that I mean, that I've... I mean, I've been in the business for 12 years. That's been my wish. People are quick to judge out there, but they don't have an idea what these girls are actually going through. I would never let this hard life be there for my kids. The tears I've cried into my pillow at night mm. is not worth it for them. I am operating by myself. I pick my customers. If I don't like a customer, mm. I'll tell him, I'm sorry, darling. I'm not interested. Well, let's talk to somebody who's brave enough to talk about it again, and that is Renee. Renee, please join me. How you doing? I'm fine. And you, Felicia. I'm fine. Here we are again. Yeah. Have a seat. Once again. Renee, I, I said to you earlier, I'm going to talk about your past, your present, and where you are going, your mm -hmm. future. Mm -hmm. Your past, are you willing to just t talk about it? You're in, in it for five years. Five years. Um, I started after my mother died, uh, wanting to get out of the house, staying with my father still. Um, I've got two boys. And um, it was quick money, not easy money, quick money. Kids are still young, seven yeah, and eight. Yeah, mm -hmm. seven and eight. That, that, those years, they were much younger. Quick money, but a very uh, grueling mm. uh, job in many ways. Yeah, um, mentally, physically. It takes a lot out of you, spiritually. Explain that. Um, mentally, uh, you have to be on your guard the whole time. You have to... Um, now what to say, you have to, you have to be someone else mm. because you're not the person you really are. Mm -hmm. You have to be um, Katie or Pam or whoever you mm. work under, you know, the name you choose to work under. You have to be that person and the person you're at home is a different person that you're at work. And uh, physically, it, um, it exhausts you. It's, the hours? Uh, um, not the hours, the, the, the physical act of having sex. So you have Can to you imagine having sex five times a day with your husband, Felicia? And now having it with somebody that you don't even yeah, know? Somebody you don't even know. That is the, the other um, uh, uh, mentally side of it. So that's money that hurts? <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's and it spiritually, it, it hurts you because it is a sin. We can argue anything against it, but the Bible says it's a sin. But why God do doesn't condemn us. You say that um, you used to operate privately. Um, yeah. How did you get yourself involved in it? How did you advertise to get clients? Okay, well, um, obviously I didn't start privately. I started in a club. I followed that through with uh, a few private houses and then about a year ago, um, just after I was on the previous Felicia show, mm -hmm. I started working on my own. I had my regular clientele uh, advertise on the internet. I don't advertise in the newspaper anymore, well, because um, it's, it's not profitable. Renee, you say that uh, you can't get out of it when you're in it. It's difficult to get out of it. Today is my last day. Oh, oh. Wow, why today? I... Well, it would have been uh, later, but um, yeah. 
But today, today is, is the, the day. day. Today uh -huh. is D-Day. Um, yeah. Is the show contributing in any way to you saying uh, today is the it's day? Been, it's been a hard desire for a long time. Mm -hmm. I've, I've, I've placed, um, I've started my own second-hand business. Mm -hmm. now second -hand selling, uh, buying and selling second-hand clothing, furniture and that type of thing. Why did and you do this before? Why did you think about prostitution first as the easiest uh, way? Because that is the hardest way to earn a living. I don't know. I can honestly say I don't know. It was, it was just a split second decision, you know. Um, but, uh, you earned a lot of money, so close to twenty thousand. Yes, I did. But now you're going to give all of this up. Yes. Um, well, it's not about money anymore, Felicia. Mm. I don't care about the money anymore. It's about where I am spiritually with God. Mm. And um, since I've, I've, I, I must add, I couldn't do it on my own. It was um, with God's. You know, You're guidance. married? Yes, I am. My husband's also, he's, he's very excited. And he knows what you involved yeah, in? Yeah, um, I met him in the business. Um, he wasn't the client as such mm -hmm. that went through, but he used to come and drink a beer and then go home. You know, and that's how we met. Mm. You say uh, we're moving forward now. God killed prostitution in my heart. Explain that. Um, well, I've been back at church, back with God, having a relationship with God for the last two years. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't close to that. And then about eight months ago, I just started you know, reading my Bible, having a relationship with God. And I asked him, Lord, you know, I know this is a sin. Help me get through it. And when I woke up in the morning. It's like when I had, when I had pl paid all my bills, I would stop working. I wouldn't go to work for the rest of the month, you know. And it's it's like you wake up in the morning and it's oh, I don't want to do this anymore. Mm. I want to do something else. And you get something else to do. I didn't know there was so much to do out there, you know. Renee, thanks again. And um, you have a message to give uh, to young prostitutes out there who are saying. I can't get out. I'm trapped in this life. Okay. I just want to tell you, you can make it because um, God is there for you. It doesn't matter where you are. You don't need to get into, um, get out of it before you serve God. Serve God and he'll get you out of it. What's the worst that happened to you when you were a prostitute? <sighs> Felicia, I think my ignorance, um, a guy came in, he wanted discipline, uh, he wanted to give me discipline. Like a fool, I said yes, because I thought it was smack smack. And I, I walked around for two months with a blue bum. Well, two weeks, sorry. Two weeks with a blue bum. That was the worst. It was... So it was not smack smack? What it was, was it? not smack smack, no. <laughs> I did, I was, I was, there are ladies catering for that, but um, if I had knew, known what it was, I would not have said yes. Excuse my ignorance, what was it? It was like really with a belt, smack smack, mm -hmm. but like a real corporal punish hiding. That is tough money. That is tough money. But it happened once, never made the mistake again of saying yes, I'll receive discipline. And I'll never make that mistake again. How much did you get paid for that day? Um, that day it was 500 rand. I'm talking about um, five years ago when I just, just mm. started. Rina, I'm happy you're out of it. Amen. And I uh, hope you never, you don't think you'll look back again? No, I won't look back. Are you sure? I know, I'm sure. So I'm so, so glad to be out. Mm. Thanks yeah. again for coming. Thank really you for having me. really appreciate it, and uh, we hope your message has managed to get across to many young women out there who are doing it. Mm-hmm, definitely. Well, let's give Renee a hand for honestly and truly managing to move in a new direction. Amen. But do men prostitute? We talk to a male prostitute after the break. If the customer is coming in, it's for about one hour and 50 minutes. I get about 320 bucks. It's lots of money.
Do you know of a good Samaritan who has done extraordinary deeds to change people's lives? Come and share the challenges. We're looking for someone who looks after AIDS babies or the elderly or disabled or homeless for free. Call us right now on 011-476-8411 on Felicia, where extraordinary people say extraordinary things. Self-mutilation. It happens. It's real. The whole thing about hurting yourself, cutting yourself. Yeah, I haven't cut myself for almost a year now. Self-mutilation. Why would anyone cut themselves deliberately? Self-destructive behavior in, in many different forms can be part of a mood disorder. I would love to do a program about it. Felicia at last talks to brave women and men about the pain and agony of self-mutilation. <laughs> When we think of prostitution, there is an almost exclusive focus on female sex workers. Male prostitution is a reality. We've talked to male prostitutes in the studio before. Let's see. I've been in the business for 12 years since I was 22. I'm now 35. I'm still in the business. You make so much money doing this. I mean, it's an honest, it's honest, it's an honest work job. Why must I work for a boss and push a pen and earn a salary of 1,300 rand a month when I can earn in a region of 75,000 rand a month? Well, tax free. Well, we're joined by two brothers, Billy and Simon, and they both say they're involved in prostitution. Let's start off with you, Billy. Um, you've been in the business now for how long? Uh, about two years and eight months. And you're only 22? I'm only 22. And Simon has been in the business for how long? Half two months. Half months. Just two months? Yes. What what, what, what made you come into the, get into the business? I know here is the is bekeerd. It's a bekeerd is a I don't it to get money. And the other work, work is scarce for the day. Is the unemployment so high that people who just decide to go and uh, do prostitution? Because it's a hard life. Billy, I mean, you say that you have, uh, your clients have mostly been businessmen, doctors, and lawyers. Yeah. Do you get good money for it? It's good money, okay. Uh, if the customer is coming in, it's for about one hour and 50 minutes, I get about 320 bucks. It's lots of money. How many clients a day? About five, six. Billy, doesn't it hurt? <laughs> yeah, I hurt a lot. I hurt a lot. But I need the money. I need it. What do you need the money for, Billy? For buying food and to have a, a living place and, yeah. Billy, do you understand that you also use drugs? Before I was using drugs for so, three years. So you. You used that money for drugs before? Yeah. Have you stopped I, using yeah, drugs? Yeah, I was stopped using drugs now about one month, three weeks ago. And before I was using between 300 and 600 bucks mm -hmm. on heroin per day before. And I think it's wrong, it's very wrong. I was using drugs because when, before I get a client, it was very difficult to sleep with him or everything. Then I was spike myself just to feel better, to, mm -hmm. just to relax and just go on. So you'd not, you'd, you just numb your body yes. and you'd not feel anything. Yeah. And you say that uh, you work only with men, uh, but you're not gay. You say you're straight. I work with men. Uh, I was starting, I was straight then. I was starting to do this job. Then I, while I, I was busy with this job, I realized, okay, I like men uh, more than women because mm -hmm. I communicate more better with men than mm -hmm. women. And your present lover now is a man. Yeah. So you've changed focus from being a heterosexual to being a gay man now. Yeah, we are involved now for about three months. Mm -hmm. And do you find that you work with women more or with men? Mana. Just men? Yes. You prefer that? Yes. Professor, let's uh, come in here with me. You've worked with Billy before, and I'm, I don't know if you work with Simon as well. I know Simon. Mm -hmm. uh, Felicia, it's, it's, it's a very complex uh, picture. Uh, my four and a half years that I worked, especially in the Pretoria area with, with male sex workers, shows that unemployment is really a major problem, mm -hmm. especially so for white boys.
and more so for Afrikaans speaking white boys. It keeps on coming back. I cannot find a job. It keeps on coming back. My dad lost his job when the big factory in Pretoria closed. I'm the only breadwinner for the family, or I'm the only breadwinner for myself. And you will hear this coming through all the time. Money is the major thing to survive. Can someone go and drive a cab? Can't you go and uh, help on a building site? This is quite right. But the problem is you need capital before you can move into another type of job. And a lot of the young men that I know are working towards that at the moment. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to save as much money as they possibly can to go for a driver's license or to acquire a little bit of money that they can start a small business concern of their own. Lack of parents. Obviously, they say they, their parents died when you were how old? I was nine years old. Nine years old. If your mom and dad were alive today and they knew that you guys were prostituting, what do you think they would say to you? If my parents were alive, I wouldn't do it. Never. Then I was having some parents who can help me, mm. support me, help me to find a job, teach me. Mm. Then I won't do this job. But now I don't have uh, parents. And I was involved with the other guy before. And that guy was my lover and he died next to me in bed. Mm. After that, I didn't have a place to stay. Then I was start working at, for this massage parlor for men to men. How did you get your brother involved? Did you encourage your brother to come into the business because you no. started first? Yeah, mm -hmm. no, no. I was going to visit him in Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. Then I asked, he asked me what I was doing. Then I told him and then he told me, no, he also has no money and he and my other brother don't work. So he needs money, he wants to come with me. I must teach him. Then I told him, no, I cannot teach him. He must come himself and see for, him, for himself. Then he was come with me, then he started doing it, and so far, he liked the money, but not a job. Mm. Were you shocked? Yeah, I was shocked. Were you bang? Yeah, I was bang. I was surprised. The first time you did it? Yeah, I was a bit scared. Bang. Bang. But now um, you feel comfortable with it? Are really. you both comfortable with it now? No, 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 not really. Because Why do you want to get out? Yeah. I want to get out of this because I think it's very wrong. It's very dangerous also because there's a lot of drugs involved and some customers come and drink some Coke or cat or heroin. Then you, you prefer you must use it with him. Why are you deciding now you want to get out of it? Is there something that really happened to you? Yeah, I was... Okay, I was meet some guy, a professor. Mm -hmm. He told me of the Lord. Then I was going to church for a couple of times. Then I realized, okay, what I do is wrong. I must respect my body. Mm -hmm. Then I was decide, okay, it was wrong. It's, and I don't feel comfortable with this job, my ultimate job. Are you here on the show today to ask for some, ask for a job, or what are you trying no. to do? I come here to. Ask for people to help me. I want to be one day a big sportsman or a plastic injection molder because I feel I need somebody who can show me the right way, mm. not the wrong way, because I don't mm. have parents. I just need somebody who can help us. Mm. In a sense, help you find a job. And uh, what do you want to do? Do you also want to get out of it? I got out of my work to be. I come from a place of. I'm not being born with parents or leaders. I'm scared for myself. And that I now need to be as a kid is, the old black work can go. And you look by like you look like a star. You look like you can do any job, really. Plus work. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd like to thank you again for coming on, and I hope that uh, somehow somebody watching here tonight will say, two strong men. Yes, I know that I have something that I can help you with. You can come and do. Is it plastic? What? Plastic injection molding. Plastic injection molder. That's yeah. what you used to do. I was before a plastic injection molder for four years. Uh huh. And you want to be a boor? Yes. Yeah, a farmer. After the break, a father who tried to get his son out of prostitution. Was it too late? And I said to Wayne, well, I won't ever see my son again. He's gone. For more information on The Felicia Show and our guests, visit www.feliciaonline.co.za.
Male prostitution, it is a reality. We are joined by a father who says he tried all he could to get his son out of prostitution. Let's talk to Len, who says his son Travis was killed in the Sizzlers or Sizzler massacre in Cape Town. How are you, Len? Very well, thank you. Tell us about your son Travis. Well, little gentle boy, soft at heart, and he had his little object that he was going to make big bucks out of doing prostitution. That's why he gave himself the name Max, Max Million, because he told his cousin that the, the surname Million is the million that he's going to make there. Let's go back to that shocking story about the massacre. Let's see. South Africa was shocked by the news of the Gay Parlour massacre in which nine men were executed. The victims were found gagged with tape, their hands tied and a gunshot wound to the head. Some had had their throats slit. The men were found when one of the Sizzler's workers managed to wriggle out of his ties and stumbled to a nearby service station to ask for help. The case has currently been postponed in the Cape Town Magistrates Court to allow one of the accused to be psychiatrically evaluated. Well, Len, when you saw the news article, when you saw it flashing on television, did you know that Travis was possibly right there? Yo, Sheila, Sheila and Wayne called me at half past six in the morning. On Sheila being? The people that I'm staying with, I'm helping Wayne run his business. They called me over and they said to me, there's been a massacre and a massage parlor down in Cape Town. Mm -hmm. I came over to their back window and had a look through the window and I saw um, the house and I said to Wayne, well, I won't ever see my son again, he's gone. Mm. And I knew right then, I just felt it inside me. That's the end, of the end of the road for him. Tell us about your son. Soft guy. We, he, had a, he had a learning problem of which I took him out of school at the age of 14. I had a major fight with the um, schooling administration. Eventually they gave me, they registered me as a school. I took him back to this, I took him through the School of Tomorrow curriculum. Um, which I had to take him at the age of 14. I had to take him right back to grade one to teach him the learning gaps mm -hmm. um, where, he had, where, where his problems were. Um, after that, we, we put him into a technical school. He went to Westridge School and he completed OB2. Mm. I took him out at the age of 17 out of there. I took him to Kempton Park College, um, put him in there. He managed to get as far as he was in N2. Mm. When did he ultimately think about prostitution, oh, or when do you think he got involved? It was, in, it was the end, end of that semester, that um, near November of, of that year, that he just ran, he had a week to go, just mm -hmm. to write the exams in N2, and he just ran away to his mother um, down in Durban. And but, that was it. That was the start of all the, the things. It could have started prior to that. He was only 16 when he started prostitution? Prostituting? Well, I don't know where, when it actually started. I could never ever get that out of him. Mm. There's certain times, certain things that they will tell you is the truth and that you have to really sense in yourself. How did you ultimately know that he was involved in prostitution? Well, when I, was down, when, when, when I finally got him down in Cape Town, um, I was driving, I was working for a pizza company because I'm a seaman. Mm -hmm. I go to sea a lot. And then when I'm on shore leave, then it's, you get bored. So I, I used to drive for a pizza delivery and do pizza deliveries. And that's when I found him on the street as a rent boy. And I said to him, Tom, brother, you get in the car mm. and that's it. You don't hang out in this. And that's where we used to sit in the flat in Greenpoint, cry together, laugh together, mm. and really try and work it out. You're on a crusade right now. Yes, I've set up a trust fund because I don't believe that we need to take the flag just because my son is... Um, deceased and I know that there's thousands of people out there there's thousands there's boys and girls mm -hmm. and I see them as children and I believe that with all the expertise that I have in in this field of knowing that it is dirty money because they go out they do their business they have the money in the pocket and it, it sets it's, it your, becomes a fi it becomes on fire your son said that he said uh, it was big bucks but dirty money yeah it's, it's totally dirty money. Did he ultimately tell you what he was doing? Yes. Um, you know, I used to deliver pizzas to that. They, the, the, the standing joke was that, you know, get Travis's dad to deliver the pizzas here. 
And then I'd walk in and make a noise and laugh and joke, and they would come out and say to me, shh. And I'd say to them, just make sure it's a good tip, otherwise I'm not coming back here. Have you talked to your wife about your son's death? Yes, um, we have, have, we have spoken about extensively it? about it. And any message you'd like to just get across before we go to break? Y yeah, I, I would just say, you know, that we need to set up an institution. We've got institutions out there for the, the terminally ill. You've got institutions out there for the, the, the kids. What are we doing for the prostitutes? Mm. Come on, South Africa, what are we doing for the prostitutes? When they get to the old, I can tell you that I even went and threw a guy out of a, an old lady down in Cape Town. I can't even, I can't mention her name because it might be a proper name. But she's 73. She's still working the streets down there. And she came to me one day and she said to me, please help me out, you know. This guy doesn't want to go. I've sold him sex. He needs to get out because I need my next customer to come in. What are we going to do to those? What are we going to do to the golden oldies? What are we going to do to the young ladies? You know, I had on Friday nights, the, the, the pimps used to come there in, in Main Road and have these little girls of 13, 14. They used to know 204. If you go down to any prostitute in Main Road there in Greenpoint and you ask them number two, 204 Marukani, ring, ring the bell, that man's down there like a flash, he'll come and help you. And don't let the pimp stand there because I'll chase him. And really, if there's any pimp sitting in this audience, be man enough, get up and leave. Okay? That's my message to you. Okay. Sorry. Thanks a million. You're quite um, emotional about this. Obviously, your son was killed. That's yeah, why. Yeah, I'm emotional for, for the other kids too. Mm. You know, I've, I've taken myself right, right back. I've worked in a nightclub. We have experienced it firsthand. Mm -hmm. You know, our government legalized abortion. And the prostitutes that used to work in the Enigma nightclub used to come in there, say, hi, Len, how are you? They used to call me Mfundis. And they used to come in there and, and say to me, feel the baby. And I used to say, oh, bless, bless this child, Lord. And the whole stomach used to go hard. And then three weeks later, she's had it aborted. How does that feel? You know, don't get emotional about it. It's not my child that I'm getting emotional about. It's not, not that. I'm saying to you, South Africa, what are you going to do? Mm. If you're not going to back me, I'm going to make you back me. Because that's the way to go. So you and are I'm not talking white, and I'm not talking any colour. I'm talking everyone that is working the streets. Mm -hmm. If you want to get out, phone me, I'll come fetch you. And not one pimp in South Africa will stop me. And that's to the pimps. I'm telling you, if you're man enough, come face me. OK. After the break, why do men and women get into prostitution? Thanks a million. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Very passionate. Thank you. I've waited so Thank long you. to do this. Thank you. The young men that I work with are there because society wants them there. Mm. Society pays them and society keeps them there. Are you an hermaphrodite, someone who was born with both male and female sex organs? Have you struggled throughout life to be accepted as male or female and want to talk about it? Call us right now on 11 on Felicia, where extraordinary people say extraordinary things. We'll be recording two shows on the 13th of July, reuniting old school friends and gambling addiction. If you would like to join us in studio, please call us on 11 476 But call soon, because seats are limited. We've been talking to men and women who are desperately trying to get out of prostitution and uh, want to change their lives. We are joined on the panel by Tanya Robinson, a sexologist from the Sexual Health Association of South Africa, who has worked with female prostitutes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And we're also joined by Professor Michael Herbs, who has researched male prostitution. So we have the right people here. Thank you for having us, yes. uh, Felicia. I really appreciate you joining us. Uh, let me first start with Tanya. Why do women get into prostitution? I think social problems that's out there, mm -hmm. um, they need money. I think that's the first reason that they actually go. There's abuse in the house, they have to get out, um, they've been married to someone that actually abused them, they need money for their children. So I think the first thing will be abuse, social problems in the setting of a household, 
and then going and to get money to save that situation. Is it easy for women to get out of it? Definitely not. No, it, because it's a body, mind, soul thing mm -hmm. and a religious problem as well um, because some of them are religious and now it's that whole shift. They can't do it and um, they can't be religious anymore and um, it is a very big problem for them. It is a mindset that they have to change mm -hmm. to actually get out and mm -hmm. it's very difficult. Um, describe the typical male sex worker. It's very difficult to describe the typical sex male worker because people don't wear tags around the necks to say, I'm a sex worker. It's the boy next door. It's, it's the guy walking next to you in the street. It could be your bank manager who's moonlighting as a sex worker after hours to get the additional money. And the reason they get into this, as Tanya said, it's really an economical thing. Somewhere people, and so I'm talking especially of the boys. I have this theory, you know, that older men like myself are responsible for them turning to sex work. Little boys learn from primary school days and they hear from their friends. If you go to a certain public toilet or to the toilets at the station maybe, there are always older men who will be prepared to fondle you or to have oral sex with you and you get money in exchange. They get older and the moment they cannot find employment, I have the theory that this little seed that was planted most probably comes back to the fore and says, there's a part of my body that can bring in money. Mm. And it's an economic thing. Mm. They need to survive. And let me tell you, Felicia, the young men that I work with are there because society wants them there. Mm. Society pays them and society keeps them there. Which is roughly what Billy was saying. Which is mm. roughly what Billy was saying who we talked to earlier. I'm looking at the research that uh, we got from you here. Male sex workers have not received the same attention as females, why? This is a worldwide phenomenon. If you look just at the definitions of, of uh, prostitution, you will find that most uh, definitions even just refer to it as a lewd woman. Mm -hmm. uh, only lately will definitions start making provision that men can also be sex workers. Mm -hmm. And men especially find it very, very difficult to accept because they don't want to hear that the hunter can be hunted. Mm -hmm because it's a very masculine type of thing to them. And male sex workers, we, uh, the, we talked earlier to Billy and Simon, but they seem to be attracted mostly to male, uh, to men rather than to female. My study do in Pretoria- Do females ever buy sex? Yes, yes they, they do. do. My mm. study in Pretoria showed that, that there's not a single agency in Pretoria that has any men on their staff except for the agencies that go exclusively for gay sex. Mm -hmm. Those are the only places in Pretoria where you'll find men selling sex then to other men. But in Johannesburg, the picture is different, especially, I believe, in the northern suburbs. We have quite a lot of men who make their services available to women. That's very true. And there's a lot of private sex workers very and much. male sex workers as well that earn a lot of money, but it is a private thing that advertise on the internet or in the newspapers or whatever. It's not so commercialized and as the massage parlor then mm -hmm. for that matter. I think women feature a lot in Joburg. That's what I see. I haven't worked in Pretoria with that. And um, they earn a lot of money. They do. It's a vicious Felicia, circle. the money is, is yes. big. I can tell well, you, I know. Big, I mean, I, I don't care how much you pay. No. It's such, it. it violates your it body. Does. But yet, Felicia, no, we, we, we must know and hear the truth. Mm -hmm. Yes, there are people there who are very unhappy with what they're doing. It's very much an economical thing. Mm -hmm. But I want to tell you that the opposite is also true. That I have worked with many boys in Pretoria who say to me, I am gay, I like what I'm doing, yes. and to get money on top of it is absolutely great. And there are people mm. who don't want to leave the scene. Mm. So we've got this whole spectrum. Because not all people are monogamous. And we have to remember that people want different partners. And some of them really like what they are doing. Yes. And the women earn up to 60,000 Rand. Yes, it's hard money, but it's the best money for someone that's not educated and actually enjoys sex and wants to do it. And I think we have to not always say, well, everyone wants to get out. 
because not everyone actually wants to get out. And what Tanya's saying is true, you know, that she was saying they were not always educated. I call it that they lack life skills, yes. that they cannot acquire any other type of, of employment. But why will you want to get other employment if you like what you're doing? I have two young men living together in Pretoria. They live in a three-story house in one of the, the most posh suburbs of Pretoria. They each own a Merc. Why would you want to leave it if you say, this is my lifestyle and I like what and I'm I doing? Like but I also have boys on the other side in my study mm -hmm. who were married and each had a child and said to me, Michael, if I can get other employment now, I'll walk out immediately because I hate myself for what I'm doing. And those are the two mm -hmm. opposites of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. The clients, mostly business people, it says 80% of people. the clients well, it must be people with money because the service is not provided for free. So yes, they are mm -hmm. businessmen and with the boys in Pretoria, in excess of 80% of the clients are married men. That's what I see with the women as well. The men that actually use the service, married men, and they are very lawyers, doctors, professional people. But that's the market that, we, that I look at. The people on the street, perhaps, that ask a fare of 50 rand or 20 rand, they'll get someone else. Or in a suburb where it's a, a lower economical thing, they'll ask something else. But Felicia, else. it's very fascinating. Even the street walkers that I prefer to, to call the, the, the boys who work on the streets, mm -hmm. they will tell you, and I have evidence mm -hmm. of it because I've been working with them on the streets for more than four and a half years. You will see who stops to pick them up even on the street. There is this aura about mm. picking up somebody from the street. <laughs> uh, some With people, AIDS rampant. I think it's a fetish if you can it actually is, go that far. It, yes. People like this little rough mm. youngster that they see on the street. Mm. And they don't feel guilty about it because they, they're also not buying the sex. Mm. I am giving him something so that he can survive. Yes. So they're doing the a social That's work right. service for that matter. Let's go to break because after the break I'd like to just find out where you stand on this. Should whether you feel it should be legalized or not. Really, I'm not in trouble. No, I'm trouble. After the break. Remove the sex work out of our residential areas, together with all the adult shops. Place them in a the red light district. Self-mutilation. It happens. It's real. The whole thing about hurting yourself, cutting yourself. Yeah, I haven't cut myself for almost a year now. Self-mutilation. Why would anyone cut themselves deliberately? Self-destructive behavior in, in many different forms can be part of a mood disorder. I would love to do a program about it. Felicia at last talks to brave women and men about the pain and agony of self-mutilation. We've been speaking to Professor Michael Herbs and Tanya Robinson about the reasons prostitutes enter into this business. How can anyone do it? Isn't it a tough business? And we found out that it's tough for some and easy for others. Should it be legalized? Yes. Very controversial. <laughs> Very controversial, but yes. Uh, socially, um, I think with the health issues, um, they can actually monitor it better with legalizing it. Well, if, if it's legalized, I mean, there's AIDS. I mean, we worried about South Africa mm. being quite up, high up there in um, AIDS statistics. So why would we want it legalized? Felicia, prostitution, or what I prefer to call it sex work, is there. It has been there mm. for a million years. It's been there as long as man has existed. We will not get rid of man. it. Man. <laughs> oh. We will not be able to wish it away. And as you rightly say, we've got HIV AIDS. We have a multitude of other sexually transmitted infections. Mm -hmm. Let's legalize it in the interest of public health and in the interest of the mm -hmm. economics of the country. And get these people registered as VAT vendors, get them registered as taxpayers, and let's control the uh, sex work industry in this country set up red light, so-called mm -hmm. red light districts, mm -hmm. remove the sex work out of our residential areas, together with all the adult shops, place them in a red light district, and the people who go there, go there for a specific reason, mm -hmm. and we're not exposing anybody to sex work 
who does not want to see it near where they are living. If it's legalized as well, we can go into those areas and actually give our expertise to help them with life skills, with condoms for that matter, with contraception, that they actually know there is a safer way, a safer way, and a healthier way to do this, emotionally as well. You're a sexologist, just how much can a woman's body take? That's the thing, I think not that much. If you look at the hours, um, the exercise that goes into sex, um, they are exhausted. It's very physical. And it is very physical. So after a day's work of six to eight hours, I can imagine, and I see it in practice, that they are exhausted. Let me just yeah. get that young lady first. I think she had a good question during the break. And my concern really is safe sex. Is it easier for sex workers to negotiate condom use with their clients? No. There is no such thing as safe sex. No. Or let mm -hmm. me say, yeah. safe sex is abstinence. abstinence. Everything else is safer yeah. sex. That's but you would like to comment on, mm, on the condom usage is. and negotiating condom usage. I think, I don't know, in the male sector, um, when I w was involved in the brothels as well, we went in and actually took packets of condoms and that they can actually know how to use it because they have to know this is how it works. This is the lubrication that you have to put on. And at the brothels, they know, all right, well, you have to use a condom. But mm. that is in the massage parlors. Mm. That's actually regulated. That's got a good brothel keeper that actually regulates the use of condoms and let health workers come in and actually tell them how it works. But there are problems as well, Felicia. We must remember that the moment that the client and the sex worker is together in the room, mm. the supervision is not there. Mm. Yep. Mm. And very often the client, and they are the ones who demand this, mm. and will secretly right. offer additional money to the sex yes. worker for no condom. Mm. And money is very attractive and very often the people will say yes for unsafe sex. Mm. We must then also remember that there's a, very often a lot of drug abuse mm. associated with sex work in the country. Mm. And the moment that you are under the influence of drugs mm. or alcohol, you take decisions or you fail to take decisions. Like uh, Billy said here, to numb his, his, his body yeah. with, with drugs. Did you ever have to, do you use condoms, Billy? Uh, let me also ask Tanya, do you use co condoms? Every time. Yes. Every time. But Billy, can we ask you, have you ever been confronted by somebody who said, let's not use a condom? Mm. A lot. They was offering me about 500 bucks on one time. More extra. Yeah. Yeah. Renee, were you ever offered uh, more money for unprotected I sex? Felicia. I have Felicia and I only have one answer for them. Mm. I don't know where they've been. I don't know what they've, do what they've been doing. If they can ask me for, con uh, for, for sex without a condom, they can ask other people. Other people might have given them that, and I won't. I won't, not even oral. This is wonderful to hear, Felicia, but again, I want to bring you back to alcohol usage yeah. and drug Drugs. abuse. Yep. People take irrational decisions mm. once that enters the scene, and, and this is where the problem comes. I think the other thing is we sit with empowered people, yeah, that we want to get out. Mm. The disempowered one yeah. is going to say, all right, give me that money. Mm. I want that 300 rand more. And I think that's the problem. Yeah. And why? Because sex workers, they've got no, well, training in to be empowered because the, the life skill thing comes in mm -hmm. again. Words of advice, words of wisdom. Tanya, let me start I off I would with say um, what I want is um, legalization. Why? Because then I can do something. Then I can do, have groups and say, all right, well, come for empowerment classes. Mm -hmm. Come for counselling because mm -hmm. you've got the money. That, and that's, yes? The, the, that'll be fine, ma'am. That you'd be able to do it. But yeah. what are you going to do with the, dr uh, the, the drug lords? What are you going to do with the, the pimps? What are you going to do with the gang leaders that have got their girls out on the street earning money. Fine, the massage parlors will agree to it because they'll stand up, they want to make an honest buck. But I'm talking about the people, the, the rent boys and the girls that are renting themselves flashing mm -hmm. on the street corners. Um, How I, are you going to regulate that? The police can't regulate it. With legalization, I feel that we can control. 
Okay. We are going to have a registered place where they can register and those are our target market that we can do something for and mm. it is a start. The, drug the moment something is not right legalized, mm -hmm. there is mm -hmm. no control. Mm -hmm. You can only start controlling something if you know where it is, what it is you are controlling. Yes. Mm -hmm. And without legalization, we cannot set apart a specific area we cannot set apart specific rules and regulations mm -hmm. on what health tests, how often, how should it be done, how should it be displayed to prospective clients. That can only come once we have regulation. Well, I know the show is not about whether they should be legalized or not mm -hmm. legalized, but again, your perspective was very, it was an eye opener in many ways. I really appreciate you coming to join us today. Thanks for having Thank us. Thank you. Well, I'd also just like to thank all the people who were brave enough to come onto the show and share their stories with us. And we wish you luck, Renee. Thank you. We wish you luck in that you've made this the day that you're Amen. going to get out of Amen. it all. And again, we hope uh, we can help you out. Billy and Simon, I hope somebody's going to call and uh, say, I want those two strong men to come and work for me. Thanks a million. Until next time. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. You guys are great communicators. Yo, man. Thank you. We just chat one other time. Yeah, that's it. Yes. Yes. For more information on The Felicia Show and our guests, visit www.feliciaonline.co.za or call 011-476-8411.